Hello, everyone. And uh, th can you hear me? Yes. All right. Yes. Hello. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'll say a little bit about myself, and then we'll get into it. So my name is Eric Langowski. I'm originally from Carmel, Indiana. I currently live in Chicago and work for the state of Illinois as a data scientist. And I'm talking to you about some research I did while I was an undergraduate at Indiana University, where I worked with the Office of the Bicentennial and Professor um, Jim Capshu, who is the university historian, on this unique and um, chapter of IU's history that was unknown to me until I began uh, this research. So in, I was actually in my last semester as a senior, and my um, boss at the Asian Culture Center forwarded me an email about a blog post talking about how um, Indiana University denied admission to Japanese Americans um, during World War II. And um, I'm also Japanese American. My grandmother was incarcerated in um, rural Colorado during the war and was of college age. So she went, was trying to go to a college um, at the same time. She ended up going to Baker College in Iowa. And um, you know the story with IU was, was something I was really interested in. So I'm going to read some of the paper that I wrote on this which was published in the Indiana Magazine of History. And then you know, I'm happy to take any questions, especially because the official ceremony to dedicate a memorial on campus is actually this Friday. So it's a very timely uh, talk, which you know, I was trying to like, arrange that secretly with the date we picked, because I thought it would be a nice coincidence. So. All right. On October 29, 1943, Indiana University's Dean of Women, Kate Hebner Mueller, received an unusually frank plea for admission into the IU Nursing School from Sumiko Itoi, a 19-year-old Japanese-American working at Robert Long Hospital in Indianapolis. Itoi asked Mueller for aid in every possible way to remain close to her sister, a student at Hanover College in southeast Indiana. Two weeks later, Itoi received a, her reply, a rejection letter based solely, unbeknownst to her, on a May 1942 decision from IU's Board of Trustees that no Jap be admitted to Indiana University. Itoi's frustrated pursuit of a college degree was indicative of the Nisei, second generation Japanese American experience during World War II. In 1942, about 7,500 of her peers, roughly 4,000 high school seniors and 3,500 enrolled college students had found themselves unable to continue their educations after President Franklin D. Roosevelt's Executive Order 9066, which authorized the forced removal and incarceration of Japanese Americans from the West Coast. During wartime, only one quarter of American higher education institutions would enroll Japanese American students, and their total enrollment numbers would never exceed their pre-war peak. Indiana University administrators often cloaked their exclusionary policy in euphemistic language about limitations in out-of-state students or decisions based on military necessity. IU Director of Admissions Frank Elliott, for example, offered that accepting even a single Japanese American student would mean the exclusion of some Indiana girl. For the duration, and inexplicably beyond the end of the war, IU's ban on Japanese American attendance continued almost without exception, despite policy changes at its peer institutions across Indiana and the Big Ten. The choice to deny Japanese American students admission to IU was not foreordained. A review of the actions of IU administrators and trustees and a deeper look at the campus community's response to their decisions reveals the injustice of the school's approach to minority communities. The stories of the rejected applicants themselves offer further evidence of inequities faced by a generation of students as they sought to rebuild their lives at Midwestern colleges. What remains is a need for institutional reconciliation and an effort to redress the public memory of Indiana University, deeply rooted in Indiana's history of white ethnocentrism. So I'll offer a little bit of background. So what makes this topic difficult to understand and for me to write about is it kind of requires you to understand three very distinct histories and the intersection of them to kind of understand what happened. So one is you know the history of Indiana University and how that relates to the history of Indiana. The, the second is you know, the history of Japanese Americans and um, you know, how did Japanese Americans go to any college and the interactions with the War Department there. And then the third is kind of the, the larger, you know, the history of World War II and, and what was going on in America and across the country at the time. So you, you have to really put yourself in the position of kind of understanding all three of those together to kind of see how the interplay of um, of you know, why, what, why IU did what they did and why other schools did what they did and what could have been possible. Um, because you know, what basically happened was at the, at the beginning, in, in, you know, right after Pearl Harbor, 
the War Department told all the, all the universities you can't admit Japanese American students. But later down the road, eventually, it was possible to get approval to admit them. Um, but many schools, such as Indiana University, you know, chose not to participate in that process. So then it kind of shifts from you know, a War Department restriction to a university restriction. Um, so that kind of interplay is something that is, was really complicated for me to understand while doing this work. Um, so I'll try to offer a little bit of context in all three of those parts, but um, you know, I'm going to have to gloss over it a little bit just because it was something that was very complicated and very new to me. So I think it's important to kind of note that um, you know, anti-Japanese and anti-Asian sentiment began long before December 1941. So you had the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1982. Um, you had laws in California in the 1913 and 1920, which banned um, Japanese Americans um, from owning land. And then you also, then in 1924, you banned all, there was a ban on all immigration from Japan altogether. So these policies kind of laid the groundwork before Pearl Harbor to the forceful internment of Japanese Americans. So, that, that's kind of the, um, the overview of that. And, I, and a quote that I always like from President Roosevelt, which kind of talked about what the government's goal with the internment or the incarceration of Japanese Americans was, uh, President Roosevelt said that um, kind of the goal of it was to distribute Japanese Americans one or two families to each county as a start, because if you scatter all 75,000 families across the United States, no one's going to um, be upset about it. And they called that process resettlement. What? Resettlement. Resettlement. Yes. So in the resettlement process in Indiana, um, before Pearl Harbor, there were only about 100 uh, Japanese Americans living in um, Indiana. Um, and you know, compared to other groups, just based on how immigration worked, you know, Japanese Americans were likely the only Asian um, group in Indiana at that time, because other groups had not yet been able to immigrate due to the restrictive policies. Um, and actually, some prominent Indiana politicians weren't, didn't publicly support the incarceration of Japanese Americans, including uh, Paul McNutt and Wendell Wilkie. But um, you know, ultimately, Indiana was, became one of the less hospitable states to resettle Japanese Americans, especially compared to the other states around it. Um, so a historian, Nancy Nakano O'Connor, summarized the situation as the prevailing prejudices in the community in competition with contemporary job seekers and limited recruiting efforts on the part of states. The state employees and universities led to only about 250 Japanese Americans um, settling in Indiana during the wartime period. Um, contrast that with Chicago, which had the, the greatest population of about 25,000 uh, people went to Chicago, including my own family. With the respect to the racial history of, at IU, um, which I'm sure many of us have heard you know, anecdotal stories about President Wells desegregating a pool or something like that, um, you know, it was really interesting to me to kind of to learn more about um, really uh, it was what um, Wells' biographer Jim, James Capshew called a system of segregation as rigid as any Jim Crow society in the Deep South. Um, so in fact, uh, any black students were barred from the ROTC, the university <coughs> band, the barbershop, and honorary and professional societies in 1939. And um, all but one local restaurant refused service to black students. And uh, one uh, telling of the racial hierarchy at the time by uh, Frank Beck, uh, the na namesake of the Beck Chapel on campus, um, actually noted that uh, Chinese, Japanese, Indians, Africans, and South and Central Americans, along with African Americans, um, were kind of included in the, these bans and, and these policies, these Jim Crow policies on campus. Um, yes, so sorry. But there's two students that actually, two Japanese, and Jap there's one Japanese and one Japanese American student in the early 20th century, which actually really stand out. There was one who was the vice president of the senior class in 1903, was uh, Hiro Ichinomiya of Tokyo, Japan. And um, a second student, uh, Masuji Miyakawa, actually was at least it, claimed to be one of, the, one of, if not the first, Asian lawyer in the United States in 1905. Um, so. 
All right, so that's kind of one of the pieces. Another piece around, so how did Japanese Americans go to college when the process worked correctly? It was extremely complicated. So there was a, an organization with the American Friends Service Committee and the Quakers formed called the National Japanese American Student Relocation Council, um, which basically became the, a pseudo government agency which solicited the necessary approvals from the War Department to um, get leave clearance from the camps to go to a college. So this was essentially, this was basically the same process to um, you know, re return someone to society to, to judge that at least the criteria they used were making sure people were loyal, that they were gonna you know, have a place to go, they were gonna um, contribute. And you know, the, their organization worked tire tirelessly on behalf of Japanese Americans, but there were so many barriers that it took um, you know, it took years or months for, for most people who wanted to go to college to get out of the camp and go to college. So, you know, famously, uh, USC actually withheld, um, the University of Southern California withheld transcripts for transfer applications, which they actually just apologized for that um, about two weeks ago. So, you know, of course, after everyone has died, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it was a very difficult process to go to, to college, and it required a ton of paperwork. Um, actually, one of the schools that was very welcome and open to Japanese Americans was Earlham College, and they've done a lot of research on that as well. Um, um, so that's another, that's a great story from Indiana. Uh, let's see. So I think by spring of 1944, only about 2,500 students had enrolled out of, you know, the, I think the graduating high, so there were high schools in camp, and the graduating high school classes I think were probably about you know four or five thousand people per year. So out of all of the people who had graduated and who were in college before, you know only twenty five hundred were able to enroll. And then by June of nineteen forty four, the the um, government agencies and uh, President Roosevelt uh, started to close the camps and. Um, repealed the exclusion order, allowing Japanese Americans to return to their West Coast homes and um, to, you know, basically make it them free to go to any college. So the University of Minnesota accepted almost 200 students in that year, um, which was basically the top number, but Indiana University um, still did not. So let's start with the history at IU. Um, so Kind of the, the context here, what we'll keep talking about is comparing IU to the Big Ten, not to other schools in Indiana, just because really Earlham was the only school in Indiana to accept Japanese Americans. Excuse me. So, and at this time, the Big Ten actually includes the University of Chicago, but it includes almost every other school in the Big Ten um, today. So you'll hear me talking about a lot of them. As I think I said before, the University of Minnesota received it was a lot of word of mouth, so like once one Japanese American was able to enroll at a college and they said it was okay, everyone else would apply there. Um, so it kind of, this whole thing starts with the University of Minnesota's president, uh, Walter C. Coffey, um, being concerned with the minor migration of Japanese Americans to his campus. He started asking all the other presidents, what, did you, what are you doing about this? What's your policy? And that kind of led IU down the process of, of creating a policy. So the, um, the initial response that Wells, um, who uh, Herman Briscoe wrote actually the response. So one of the things that, you know, you'll notice a lot of people who, building, who had buildings named after them um, here. Uh, and he talked about how um, his response basically said, IU offers scholarships for German refugees, for Spanish refugees, for Chinese students, and for Czechoslovakian people. Um, but they had no, no plan in place for um, Japanese American students. So the university then set out to decide should IU admit Japanese Americans, wait for more information from the military, or ban them. So on April 29, 1942, the Administrative Council, a body set up by Wells consisting of unit managers, met to discuss the question of admission of American-born Japanese who had been evacuated from the West Coast. Finding that they could not agree, the council decided to refer the matter to IU's Board of Trustees. A day later, um, IU actually received an application for um, two Japanese American students um, in the Department of Botany and Bacteriology. 
whose names were uh, William Su Suyemoto and Robert Omada. So the trustees were deciding both whether or not to have a policy going forward and what to do about these two specific students. So during the May 9th, 1942 meeting, um, the trustees had a debate about it, which um, strangely enough, there was an actual transcript of the words said at the trustees meeting, which is not something that I could find very often in the archive, but there is for this meeting. And it's very illuminating what they, what they had to say. So Wells introduced the issue at this meeting, talking about how the administrative council was split 50-50 on what to decide. Immediately after Wells finished introducing the topic, um, three trustees, Bloomington newspaper editor Paul L. Feltis, financier Ooz McMurdy, and banker William A. Kunkel Jr. said they would rather not take them for the duration, the duration of the war. Trustee John Hastings, a lawyer, then added that, aside from that, is it they're the point that our resources are pretty well strained now. Wells responded saying, not particularly. And then board president Ora L. Wildermuth stated his opinion. As I see it, there's a difference in Japanese and German or Italians. They are Aryans and can be assimilated, but the Japanese can't. They are different racially. I believe that any Japanese, no matter where he was born, is nothing but a Japanese. Kunkel and McMurdy then moved that no Jap be admitted to Indiana University and the ban passed. They, they, they then had a follow-up issue was, if, if Japanese Americans were native of Indiana, would they be banned? And on that issue, Wildermuth proposed a more tactful approach, suggesting that we might say that it is the recommendation of the board that the director of admissions discourage the application of non-resident Jap applicants. And then trustee Peterson suggested that a negative decision on the four admissions requests before the trustees would let the director of admissions know then, just by inference, that we do not wish to do it. And Wildermuth also then, of course, added he was afraid that any Japanese American would get into subversive activity wherever he would have a chance. And then Wells closed the discussion by suggesting that admitting Japanese Americans might make campus unsafe. There's this to be said about, this is quoting Wells, there's this to be said about the situation when the casualty lists begin to come in, even though they might be loyal Americans as anybody, feeling is going to mount very high, you might have disturbances on campus, particularly when you have the Navy here. And the trustees voted unanimously to um, ban Japanese Americans and uh, residents of Indiana. So that, that's kind of how IU started out to the issue. So you know, there were three choices they could have had. They could have you know, done nothing and waited. They could have waited for you know, the military to issue guidance, or they could have you know, had an outright ban. And, this, and most, most universities just waited for what the military was going to tell them to do, because um, you know, the status quo at this time was no Japanese Americans could be admitted because they were in the internment camps, so there was no way to get the Japanese Americans to campus to be admitted unless the military approved, and they weren't approving yet. So that's, that was kind of the, you know, the origin story of, of what happened. And then on May 12th, Wells approved the following form letter to be sent to any Japanese American applicant. Dear blank, in view of the present uncertain military status of the Southern Indiana Geographical Zone, in which Indiana University is located, this university is not accepting Japanese students at the present time. Yours very truly, Herman B. Wells. So yeah, you know, that's a, a very, you know, when I, when I kind of found out about this, I was a little shocked because, you know, it goes against a lot of what, you know, colloquially we think of the public history of Indiana University as, you know, being open and, and very open to diversity and everything like that. And, you know, a lot of that kind of goes into the, you know, the mythology of, of Herman B. Wells and um, kind of the myths, you know, you have around campus, whether, um, you know, it's going up and shaking the hand on the statue or, or him desegregating a pool or something like that. So it's, it's really interesting to actually know, you know, when, you're, when you get into the archive and, you're, and you start to look at what is, how do people respond to what was a very difficult question because, you know, no one knew what was going to happen at the time the war was going on. Um, you know, the military had, had clearly signaled something was up with the Japanese Americans because they put them all in the camps. Like, today we know that was wrong and there was no justification for that. The, the trustees didn't. So, you know, it is, there is a lot of complexity to it, but... Um, no, it's all right. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, when, you, when it comes down to it, like, the... <laughs> the follow-up question that um, the director of admissions wrote the, the next week was, 
um, what about German and Italian students? And um, you know, the response was the Board of Trustees took no action regarding them. So. All right, so I, that's kind of how the band begins. So let me get into some of the stories of, of Japanese Americans trying to get onto campus still, because you know, one of the things about this whole history too is we know what Wilderman just said and what the band was, um, but you, from the letter I read that from what Wells said, you know, that's all they said publicly. So you know, the policy was actually unknown to everyone throughout the war, and there was a lot of confusion over what it meant as well. Because it is very unusual you know, for a university to, to automatically reject someone based on their race. There's not really a good bureaucratic procedure to do that, so there were a lot of questions and clarifications which, which are, are very interesting. So, um, kind of, let's, let me start with, yeah, so there's, if you, in my paper, there's some side stories which I think are interesting, but I'll skip here. Uh, let's, let's talk about Frank Beck, because, you know, again, Frank Beck, at least from what I've learned about him in the archive, clearly was a, a very amazing guy. And his work with, he actually spent a lot of time trying to get um, Japanese Americans admitted, and he worked with the Student Religious Cabinet, which was a, a student organization on campus, to, to kind of have debates about, um, how to have refugee students and how to support, like how he could support having refugee students on campus, which is Japanese Americans were internal refugees and that's kind of how they were referred to um, at the time. And so he writes the NJASRC, the American Friends, the, the pseudo-governmental organization in charge of getting Japanese Americans out of the camps to colleges. And they actually told him to, you know, take it easy and not push too hard because they were really worried about, um, you know, they really wanted to follow the procedure the military had dictated, and they were worried about anyone kind of going around that, and you know, because the military really had no way to prevent a Japanese American from being enrolled. It was all just kind of based on this, um, you know, top-down method of, but like the military wasn't actually checking every person who was admitted or something like that, so um, I don't, that might not make perfect sense, but, um, that's, that was kind of the situation. So the, and it's also actually made it, made it into the Indiana Daily Student, the IDS, um, which we're talking about how um, uh, the university would be willing to cooperate with the um, official plan to admit Japanese Americans if it is agreed upon by the Army and the Association of the State University Presidents. So you can kind of, and then you also, Beck also writes to Wells where they, where they talk about um, kind of, it's hard to, one of the things I was always trying to gain from the archive was, you know, what did Wells really think about this? What was Wells' take on it? Because it, you know, it kind of doesn't align with everything else he did. Um, and he never talked about it publicly and he never wrote about it either in, in anything in the archive. So it's, you can only kind of hear people talking about what they talked about with him. And Beck writes that the students who met with Wells on the issue agreed with they, they accepted 100% your interpretation of the situation and will so report to their respective organizations. I thought I knew the score, but thought that there was great values to come from you giving it to them. So, you know, I mean, and it's also, you know, important to consider, of course, this is very early in Wells' presidency and w trustee President Wildermuth was a, a very powerful man who had appointed Wells and, you know, I think, it's speculation, but I, I think that it's very likely that, you know, if Wildermuth ha kind of had these views and, you know, said them publicly in the trustee meeting and got them encapsulated into the policy, that there was not really anything Wells could have done to have the trustees overturn their policy. So that's another issue that, you know, I'll talk about a little more, but, you know, kind of continually grappling with, you know, how do we evaluate the actions of the past with what we know today? and with the limitations they had at the time. And it, you know, it's very difficult with Wells because you know, he, there's very little to go on. Um, yes, okay. So let's skip ahead a little bit more. Let's talk about Earlham College a little bit. Um, Earlham's president, W.C. Dennis, actually publicly advocated to accept Japanese Americans in an editorial where he described um, the college's work as aligning with the forces, the ideals for which we are fighting and the principles of the religion which we profess, 
He then asked, is there any need to be forced to defend the enrollment of loyal American citizens in an American college? He, Dennis actually sent this to Wells, and Wells wrote back that he thoroughly agreed with what Earlham had done and wanted, and, and Wells quote, wanted to have some of them here as soon as our local police officers are in a position to give them the protection demanded by the federal government. One historian actually called this statement a bald-faced lie made only to be politically correct to keep IU on the same moral high ground as Earlham because as far, the requirement did, didn't really exist. So. The person most directly involved with the implementation of the ban was Frank Elliott. And on September 14th, 1942, Elliott wrote Briscoe, who was, so Wells was um, you know, working for the federal government and splitting his time between DC and IU. And whenever Wells was gone, Briscoe was um, you know, stepping in in some way. So Elliott wrote, you wrote me last April, we should admit them. Then on April 30th and May 6th, you wrote the trustees would consider the question. Later, I was advised that they were not to be admitted. I so notifi notified the various admitting officers on June 12th. President Wells approved initial the following copy of a letter to go to Japanese applicants. We have sent this letter to all applicants since. Now Professor Kavanaugh writes that Professor well President Wells and you tell him that the barring of Japanese <laughs> students might have been due to a misunderstanding. He has sent a correction to the Extension Center. So, you know, the kind of the predecessor of IUPUI um, in Indianapolis, the Extension Center um, at this time, actually admits Japanese Americans because they didn't know they weren't supposed to. So, you know, it's it's, <laughs> and and they have a great time there. It's actually, you know, the whole the whole chapter is kind of a weird chapter of history, but. Um, on October 11th, there was a town hall discussion about uh, Japanese Americans and whether or not they should be admitted. Um, and there actually was a Japanese American student admitted before Pearl Harbor um, named Sunio Miyabara, who's still on campus and still a student. Um, and he runs this town hall talking about um, his take on the matter. And um, Frank Beck argues that there should be no discrimination against Japanese Americans. and. They, they take it out to a poll, uh, a poll of the community and a poll of the students. Um, but before that poll, the, there's an, the IDS publishes an editorial that says, um, we should not exclude a chosen few from the periphery of um, the Japanese and condemn all that have, has any part of Japanese or any other aliens just because we happen to be warring with their patterns of living. So, you know, kind of directly or indirectly in support of Japanese Americans being enrolled. And the survey has, um, out of the survey, 36 people believe that Japanese Americans should be able to continue their educations. Two were undecided and 15 believed they should be deprived. Some people said stuff like, if it is okay with the FBI, it is okay with me. Others said it was wrong to discriminate against a racial group. And others said things along the line of, well, I wouldn't want to live with them, but if they lived with someone else, you know, that would be fine. Um, yeah, I know, it's, it was a weird time, very different time. So uh, in December of 1942, uh, history professor Albert Kohlmeyer, a, a trusted colleague of Wells, wrote to the NJSRC um, on behalf of Wells why IU would not participate. And he said, inasmuch as our university is making an all-out effort to cooperate with the national government in training and educating men and women for the armed forces, it would appear obvious that bringing some of these Japanese American students onto our campus would present us with a problem that would not be created in institutions that, because of principles or for other reasons, would not have upon their campus men and women in uniform. Needless to say, we are in most hearty accord with your noble effort, and we are sure that you appreciate our particular, peculiar problem along with similar institutions. If anything changes, we will at once get in touch with you. Of course, you know, something, some things did change in that, you know, the, there was an all Japanese American um, military unit, the 442nd Regimental Battalion Combat Team, uh, which rescued the Lost Battalion of um, Texas um, in that battle, and what ended up being like the most decorated um, unit of their size in military history. So there, you know, there were Japanese Americans serving in the military. So, in 1943, um, there's not a lot in the archive, and um, 
you know, understandably so, the administrators were occupied with the war effort, not uh, Japanese American students. By November of 1943, um, IU had received a few more applications, and the most poignant application um, we received, which I talked about a little bit at the beginning, from Sumiko Itoi, whose um, son will actually be attending the ceremony on Friday. And her application, we, we actually have her application letter and the, the response to her and everything in the um, archive, but I already read a little bit of it, so I will skip, skip that. But the response, the response basically from the Dean of Women says, um, I'm very sorry to send a discouraging reply to your very fine letter, and I'm also sorry to have delayed in answering it. And she noted that there were no arrangements for Japanese Americans to enroll at IU, claimed that the university had not received any applications before hers, and encouraged her to look at other nursing schools. And actually on this letter, in the margins, there's a note that says, HBW for Herman B. Wells thinks he told her that students from the state were admitted. So you kind of have, you know, this is almost when he intervened, but you know, he didn't intervene until after, he only wrote that note on the letter, not, not actually admitted the student. And one of the things that I think, you know, is especially important to note is that, um, you know, so for Sumiko, she was, her, fam her parents were still in camp and she was trying to be close to her sister and she was 19. So, you know, you kind of have this situation where it's not just, you know, any normal college admissions process, it's, you know, a much more precarious one. And ultimately what ended up happening was after she was denied admission, she ended up joining the Cadet Nurses Corps on Long Island, New York, and didn't see her parents again for over a year, or anyone from her family. So, you know, it's, you can kind of see the, the impacts of being admitted or not admitted to a school. Uh, of course, there were some schools that did admit Japanese Americans, but, you know, it was a very arduous process, so it often had, did have some negative impacts on people who were rejected. Okay. What should we talk about next? Um, so by 1944, many IU students were actually starting to openly question why Japanese Americans could not be admitted. And this is when, um, you know, Japanese students started getting admitted to the Extension Center in Indianapolis. So you see that um, this, like, this is kind of also when you kind of start to see Wells maybe playing behind the scenes. So you know, the trustees said, basically the official trustee policy was, you know, no anyone who is Japanese American but not living in the state can't be admitted to Bloomington. That's how he interpreted it. So you know, he says, well, now we can revise the policy to say. Um, it only applies to Japanese Americans who are in the camps, in the relocation centers, and it doesn't apply to Indianapolis because you know the the war contract, the Southern Defense, Southern Indiana Defense Zone, you know, isn't the same in Indianapolis. You know, of course we do have Crane here, so like you know you can kind of think of that. But at least in my research, the only time I've actually found that excuse somewhat plausible is at the University of Chicago where they had the Manhattan Project, um, which of course you know that same level of research wasn't wasn't going on at IU. So they, they end up receiving some applications at the Extension Center, and um, you know, they actually, those folks end up starting a family and you know, have, a, have a great time by all accords, um, according to the archive, which you know, again is, you know. <laughs> yeah, like, I think it's important to note that at least the, the racism that Japanese Americans faced was really concentrated on the West Coast. In, in Indiana, you know, you, you had kind of the abstract, I guess, racism against Japan, but, um, or animosity against someone you're fighting in the war. But because there weren't any Japanese Americans in Indiana at all, it's kind of hard to really have that same level of racial animosity. So at least any Japanese American who made it into Indiana, Indiana, you know, really seemed to, to have an okay time. Um, okay, so let me skip ahead a little bit to um, a quote from Herman B. Wells in March of 1944, uh, where he gave a sermon at um, 
I didn't write down which church it was, but I think it was like First Presbyterian or something um, in Bloomington, where he said, first we must re prepare to renounce prejudice of color, class, and race. Now this renunciation of color, class, color, and race prejudice, where in England, in China, in Palestine, no, we must renounce prejudice of color, class, and race in Bloomington, Monroe County, Indiana. Our renunciation must be personally implemented by deeds, our actions, will measure the sincerity of our words. So he says this in March, and in May of 1944, um, uh, some students actually try to transfer from Earlham College to IU. Again, you know, the context within this is, you know, IU had a lot more programs and majors, so you already, you've seen, like people are trying to go to IU for programs that are, that are really hard to get into anywhere else, like nursing or medicine. Um, this student is trying to go to to um, dentistry, yeah, but, um, and at the same time, the, all the restrictions are removed in September 1944, and the IU received a letter that says, Japanese American students were now to be accepted, quote, on the same basis as any others, and all restrictions are now removed. And two weeks later, Elliot wrote back and said that IAU no longer has to seek approval from the Provost Marshal General for the employment or attendance of persons of Japanese ancestry at Indiana University. This did not end the trustees' um, policy, though. So I guess now, you know, now we're in late of 1944, and we actually receive, the, the issue goes back before the trustees because um, some two honorably discharged veterans who are Japanese Americans applied to IU. So then IU had to ask, you know, can we reject these veterans who honorably served their country based only on their ancestry? So on October 27th, Private James S. Nishimura, Company 1st Battalion, 442nd in Infantry of Honolulu, Hawaii, sought enrollment in the College of Arts and Sciences. He had been a student at the University of Hawaii until Pearl Harbor interrupted his studies and he joined the military and he was currently discharged at Foster General Hospital in Jackson, Mississippi. And of course, IU sends him a letter back that says, please be particular to state whether or not you are of Japanese ancestry, and he says yes. The second veteran, Motomu Musashi, was still hospitalized, also requested admission to IU under the GI Bill of Rights. So on December 5th, 1944, Briscoe wrote to Wells recommending that the issue of Japanese veterans be presented to the Board of Trustees. He attached a letter from Elliot, which presented the two cases. In addition, he also added the case of Richard Doy, who was, um, incarcerate, was previously incarcerated in Arkansas and now working in Cleveland, and some recommendation letters for Doy. So Elliot asked if the policy on Japanese Americans should be reconsidered in view of the two new developments. One, the fact that veterans are now among the applicants, and two, the fact that the Provost Marshal General has removed the former restrictions. On December 14th, the Board of Trustees unanimously voted to approve the admission of Japanese American students who served and were honorably discharged, but they did not change the ban on non-veteran students. So Doi was rejected and Nishimura and Musashi were admitted, but neither would enroll in part because um, it took many months for IU to get back to them and you know, have the trustees vote on changing the policy, about, about six or seven months. So, you know, at this time, the government had rescinded the exclusion orders, which prevented Japanese Americans from returning to the West Coast. Um, but, you know, um, they were only admitting Japanese Americans who were legal residents of the state or honorably discharged veterans. Japan surrendered on September 2nd, 1945, and three days later, Elliot wrote to Itner, who was um, with the Board of Trustees, whether or not we should admit Japanese students since the war is over and then an application was pending for Makoto Hayashi. The next day, the ban was added to the agenda, and then another applicant, um, Hiroshi Suzuki, um, wanted to enroll at the School of Dentistry. So then on September 20th, 1945, Wells reopened the discussion, asking, shall American citizens of Japanese descent be admitted to Indiana University in any different manner than any other citizen of the United States? And this time, the Board of Trustees repealed its ban on Japanese American students, adding that the admitting agencies of Indiana University are free to deal with the admission of American citizens of Japanese descent in the same manner and with the same safeguards as other students. Present at this meeting were five members who had voted for the ban in 1942. Four days later, Wells passed a decision along to Elliott, 
writing simply, the Board of Trustees rescinded its action of May 9, 1942 to the effect that the Board disapproved the admission of Japanese students. The ban that had lasted nearly three and a half years had finally come to an end, and to, to at least my, my knowledge, that was the most that Wells ever spoke of it. I also have um, in my paper, there's two great stories of actually the first Japanese Americans who were admitted, um, including Ted Sukiyama, who was another veteran who I got to interview in Hawaii, I wrote all over the phone, I didn't go to Hawaii, but um, who actually wrote a memoir and talked about his experiences at IU and you know, how great they were. It was, it was very interesting. And then the, another student, um, Kiyoshi Ota, um, got a BA in psychology in June of 1948 and also served as the president of the photography club. And then a, a finally, a, um, another student, um, David Mitsugi Ohara um, was trying to transfer from Graceland College and IU actually wrote a letter to Graceland College and said, we received the transcript for David Mitsugi Ohara and note that he was born in Japan and is not yet an American citizen. The state of Indiana has practically no Japanese population. Indiana can accept only a few non-resident students and tries to select them very carefully. We wonder if you would be willing to give us your impression of Mr. Ohara and particularly whether you would think he would fit into our campus society. As far as I can tell, he did because he became the campus life editor for the 1948 yearbook. So, you know, that's again another interesting uh, bit of history. So, you know, at the end, I'll talk a little bit about kind of at least the two questions I was grappling with the most here are, you know, how does this relate to the legacies of Wildermuth and Wells? You know, it's pretty clear that. Um, <coughs> Wildermuth was showing um, attitudes motiv motivated by, you know, racist ideas um, during that trustees meeting. And, you know, in addition to what we know now, um, when I wrote this paper, I, we were, he still had the, the gym was still named after him and, and everything like that. But, you know, since then, I think in part because of kind of learning about what Wildermuth had said about Japanese Americans in addition to African Americans, um, you know, his legacy has kind of been redefined by the university. But you notice that, you know, that, wasn't, that process took many years, and um, there's a speech about Wells uh, talking, who was when he was the university chancellor in 1971, when he renamed the field house to be after Wildermuth, uh, where he talked about, he said, I, you know, he basically gave a resounding endorsement of Wildermuth and how pleased he was that the, um, from this day on, the name of Wildermuth will be familiar to every student, and those who use the center will pay tribute to its virtual founder through perpetuating his name. So it's actually interesting that you know when the trustees first tried to change the name of the building, um, one of the trustees brought up this quote and, and basically asked, you know, who are we to judge Wildermuth more than Wells, who knew him and, and said this in 1971? You know, which you know is kind of the whole debate I'm having now with myself about who, you know, what can I say about what happened in 1942? Um, but, you know, ultimately the trustees did decide to change the name. You know, and I think it's very appropriate that it's named after um, Bill Garrett. For Herman B. Wells, I think, you know, he oversaw the bureaucracy that effectively executed the ban. And, you know, no one, as far as I can tell, no one made it through um, I went through the yearbooks and everything like that. Um, but at the same time, he was opening campus to African-American students. So this incongruity, I think, was something that I always struggled with. But you know, in 1942, um, he, he didn't oppose Wilmoth saying what he did in the trustees meeting. He talked about campus disturbances and the uncertain military status of Southern Indiana. He um, implied that IU would accept Japanese Americans once the situation approved, but they waited until after the war was over. In June, um, you know, he kind of, he failed to, in June of 1942, he didn't complete a procedural step to get clearance from the military to admit Japanese Americans, even though like, it was basically like pre-clearance, you just did it if you wanted Japanese Americans to come, regardless of whether, whether or not they would actually come. Um, he wrote a rejection letter in July of 1942 where he talked about how it was necessary to limit the admissions from other states. He couldn't 
he claimed that IU couldn't accept Japanese Americans unless the federal government took responsibility for their safety. Um, he didn't tell outside groups about the ban and what Wildermuth had said. He just talked about the military situation. In, um, you know, with Sumiko Itoi, he said she should have been admitted, but after the fact and, you know, didn't change the situation. In January of 1944, he asked for an exemption for, um, or in September of 1944, he asked for an exemption only for veterans, but it, you would kind of, you know, the, there's some logical dissonance there of why, you know, what's different about veterans than other Japanese Americans. And, um, you know, in September of 1945, he finally asked the uh, trustees to end the ban. So, you know, I think we could speculate that he was trying not to anger the trustees, and it could have been political maneuvering behind the scenes, but um, I think his administration in this case failed to um, meet his own aspirations for civil rights in Bloomington. So, I'll briefly talk about, you know, how does that lead into the apology which is happening this Friday. So, starting, with, starting in the 1980s, Japanese American political leaders uh, embarked on a, a process called redress, which led to a, fit, a congressional commission being created, the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians, um, which made a report, <coughs> Personal Justice Denied, um, which, which said that the internment was caused by race, prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. This led to the federal government passing the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, granting reparations to surviving incarcerees as part of an official apology for the American people. Signed by President Ronald Reagan, um, Newt Gingrich voted yes on that bill. So it was, you know, very impressive political lobbying. Uh, it was bipartisan. And I, in this apology, as um, many historians argue, kind of allowed Japanese Americans to reclaim their place within American society. You know, typically when someone is incarcerated or put in jail, they did something wrong. And this kind of showed, to, at least to the public, that, you know, they, they shouldn't have been. So the government, after the government apologized, um, Japanese Americans started asking universities to apologize. So they started with retroactive diplomas from West Coast institutions from which they had been forced to withdraw. Um, including all the public schools. Um, you know, the private schools like USC uh, have lagged behind but are, are getting around to it. And one of the first schools to do it was the University of Washington in 2008, which um, the degrees were conferred um, nunc pro tunc, which, um, you know, is a, kind of a rare type of honorary degree in um, now for then designed to correct an earlier mistake. So that kind of leads into what happened at IU. Um, yeah, I think, so when I was, you know, after I wrote this paper with um, the Office of the Bicentennial and the university, um, it was published in um, late 2019. Uh, some professors and I um, sent a letter to the trustees and um, the President McRobbie which led to him issuing an apology in July of 2020, which um, he, which in his um, issuance of that, he said they were gonna issue a, a plaque with a statement of regret and form a committee, um, which consists of Nick Collither, history professor, James Nakagawa, photography, Karen Inouye, who's the chair in, in American Studies, Lisa Doy, who is a graduate student in American Studies, Ashlyn Nelson, who's at the Public Affairs School, Dina Okamoto in Sociology, and Scott O'Brien in East Asian Languages and Culture. And I was also added to that committee. But that committee kind of worked with the, the, um, the provost, including the, the new provost, Applegate. Um, and this Friday, uh, a plaque will be dedicated in a bench, and they also will announce a scholarship, accompanying scholarship program. Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of the overview of what happened and you know where we're going from here so thank you for listening and i'm happy to take any questions so when you say big 10 schools do you mean like the athletic big 10 like purdue michigan state yeah that's right so the big 10 is um, also kind of a formal academic you know we always think of the athletic side but it also was like they also had like a big 10 policy council
which I'm sure they still have, where all the universities there try to decide, um, or if there's an issue they think affects everyone, I guess they talk about it. Um, so, you know, like the University of Minnesota admitted a ton of Japanese Americans, the University of Chicago, uh, basically everyone in the Big Ten admitted at least one, except the University of Chicago and Indiana University. Um, most of the other schools admitted about a dozen, um, with the University of Minnesota admitted, um, you know, more than everyone else combined. Yeah, there's always, so I worked at the Asian Culture Center on campus and, you know, there's this picture on the wall of him coming to the um, dedication of it when it, I think it started in 1999 or 2000, something like that. So, you know, he always was a, a strong advocate, advocate for diversity and inclusion, but, um, you know, at least the combination of this being at the very beginning of his presidency and the war, um, you know, for whatever reason, he wasn't able to, to do that in this case. My grandmother, yeah. So I'm a quarter Japanese. My grandmother. Do you remember her talking about it? Oh, she's still alive. Yeah, she's 99. Yeah, I talk to her about it all the time. So. What was her? Um, how did she feel about that? Yeah, I mean, so I went to the one of the reasons I was interested in doing this is because I wanted to do some research on her family story as well, and you know, she applied. I, there's, I always get the Iowa State schools confused. I don't know if it was Iowa State or University of Iowa, but she applied to that. That was the school she wanted to go to. And, you know, in the archive, they have, they mailed out, the same day they mailed out her rejection letter, they mailed out a, a rejection letter to another Japanese American. And both of them kind of say this reason about, you know, the military situation, we can't admit Japanese Americans at the same time. But, you know, it's kind of, at least in my mind, the coincidence of it being the two Japanese American students on the same day suggests it was something similar to what IU was doing. Um, but she was able to go to, you know, Baker, a small school. Um, she had a great time there, I think. I mean, it, she was away from her family, so it was hard. And, um, but, I mean, I think the Quaker elements there really incorporated and, and brought her in, so she was able to succeed. She became a teacher at Chicago Public Schools. And, Eventually taught at a, taught at one of the Chicago community colleges. Uh, she taught teachers for the rest of her career. So, yeah, that's very nice that you could do that. Share that with her now. Yeah, no, she's very proud of me. So, <laughs> <laughs> is she going to be here on Friday? No, unfortunately. So, yeah, yeah. She still lives by herself, but it's kind of hard for her to travel. Is she yeah, Chicago? yeah. She lives in Vernon Hills on the north side. So. Was she? Was she born in Japan? No, so she was born in uh, at Los Angeles. So her her parents immigrated in eighteen eighties. So through Angel Island, probably. We went to Angel Island. They might have been before Angel Island, but I think it might it would have been if it was around. So Yeah, so that's kind of the weird quirk of where Japanese Americans live. Like 98% of Japanese Americans in the mainland lived on the West Coast. And more Japanese Americans actually lived in Hawaii than in the entire mainland. Um, but, you know, in Hawaii, there was no um, camps because it would have destroyed the local economy because they would have rounded up too many people. So, you know, you know even where Pearl Harbor was, there actually wasn't, you know, those Japanese Americans were, were always free, but the ones on the West Coast were um, incarcerated. People on the East Coast, there were a few in New York. Those were basically the only people, um, in addition to like very rural areas in the mountain states, who were not incarcerated. Um, you know, one of the anecdotes I always like to tell is the, um, for Japanese Americans who lived around Washington, D.C., it's actually one of the few times that they went and broke into the census and looked at individual census records to find every Japanese American there to round them up in a way that, you know, it was, the census finally apologized for it a few years ago, but, you know, it was something, something that's never supposed to happen with the, with the census, so. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, so she was in camp in Colorado. Um, so, you know, she was trying to, basically you had to go, you probably had to go east of Colorado. So Iowa is close by. Um, and most of the, most schools admitted, like they tried to admit, they had a quota, so they tried to admit like 10 students. So she was, I think she said one of her friends went there, said it was all right, and she was able to follow them um, before they stopped admitting more students. But there was no connection to Iowa. I don't know if she's, you know, I've, I've never been to Iowa with her, so. <laughs> maybe in the last year or two that there's been discrimination against Asian American students for admissions or scholarships. I think maybe a lawsuit against Harvard or something, but, but have you picked up on any of that at IU or across the country in your research? Yeah, I mean, that's not, I haven't studied, that kind of gets more in my other, I'm, you know, I'm a data scientist. I, I do study modern data issues, not as much with colleges, more with government, but, um, no, I mean, affirmative action is, you know, a difficult topic. I was actually talking about this with some other of my friends about, you know, how does this, you know, how does like the, the policy affect basically banning Japanese Americans, you know, how do, does that kind of relate to affirmative action today, which, which you know, offers a, um, um, I, don't, I don't want to call it a preference, but offers a, a benefit to, people based on their identity to create more diverse campuses. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, that case is currently going on in Harvard. Um, but I, I think at least with affirmative action, the bigger issue might be legacy admissions and other types of admissions, which also, you know, it's not that minority students are being evaluated differently, but um, you know, there, there are also other types of students who are being evaluated differently based on, you know, whether or not their parents went there or they were, they're in athletics or something like that. So it is a complicated issue, but, you know, I think the larger issue with Asian Americans today is around the, um, you know, the, the coronavirus pandemic and the hate crimes um, spiking against Asian Americans, which luckily, you know, that hasn't impacted um, Japanese Americans too much, but you know, like in the Chinatowns on the West Coast or in New York City, I think we've seen a lot of um, violence directed at Asian Americans related to the pandemic. But um, you know, I, I hope that it's getting better now as the pandemic kind of heals over. So, you quoted Herman Wells a couple of times as at least suggesting that the ban was for the security of the Japanese students themselves. Did you encounter any evidence that in Indiana Japanese students were targeted for violence or discrimination? Yeah, to some extent, that's a counterfactual because they weren't here. But if you look at Ur <laughs> if you look at Erlum, you know, they did great there. And I mean, it's I can't, you know, it's also in southern Indiana, so I don't know how different you know the situation there would have been from here. There was um, kind of a famous example from, uh, I think, Park College in Missouri. I don't, I don't know if it's still around in the same name, where there was a community pushback to admitting Japanese Americans, but um, it was always, at least when there was a debate about it, it was always kind of about the number of students admitted, not like directed at the students who were already there. Um, it, was, it kind of goes back to this question of like, you know, taking someone's spot or, or something like that, which some of the administrators about you talked about, um, which it seems like that was always kind of the issue that was more of a flame point versus, you know, once the student was already here, like we had a Japanese American student just hanging out at IU for most of the war who was admitted before the war. And that, as far as we could tell from the archive, nothing ever happened to him, so. Thanks so much.